When you gaze up at a towering skyscraper, what comes to mind? Engineering? Architecture? What about math? But not just any math. Get ready as we ascend the infinity tower of eye to the eye and unravel the mysteries hidden within its spiraling layers. So strap in, put on your thinking caps, and prepare for a mathematical ride that's nothing short of imaginary. And a good question to ask yourself anytime you're looking at one of these weird structures for the first time is, is it even possible? And a nice way to get an idea is to treat this tower like a sequence. If we just start with I and plot it in the complex plane, we can get the next piece of the tower by plotting I to the I, then I to the I to the I, and so on. And the higher we transcend this tower, the more we see it spiraling into one spot. Now, this is not rigorous proof for its existence, but it is pretty good evidence that there should be some answer. Maybe something around 0.4 plus 0.4i. Now, if we assume that this thing exists, our next challenge is actually solving it. There are three main tools I'm going to use in order to try to find an answer in this video. The first tool is the complex logarithm. The complex logarithm is basically the extension of the natural logarithm to non-zero complex numbers. Working with this function can sometimes be annoying because it's multi-valued for those of you who know what I'm talking about. But in this video, we're just using the principal value, and that's all I'll say about it here. If you want to learn more about the complex logarithm, I have a video on it you can check out later. Next is an old friend of the channel, the Lambert W function. This is a really useful tool for solving equations, especially these power tower equations. Essentially, it's the inverse function of x e to the x, although here we'll be using it in the realm of complex numbers. This function can be its own basket of worms. For now, we'll just keep in mind that w of z e to the z equals z for any complex number that we really care about. For our last main tool, I'm going to listen for the groans of the first semester calculus students as I call out Newton's method. This is basically an algorithm that provides better and better approximations to functions, namely their roots or their zeros. This uses the derivative and is going to help us figure out what our Lambert function actually evaluates to. Newton's method can be a little bit clunky and has its own problems if you pick a bad starting value, but I promise in this video it'll be okay. Now we're also going in with the basics of properties of logarithms and how complex numbers work. Let's call our problem z. Our job is to find z, and we can do that using an old trick with these power towers by rewriting the entire exponent as z. Why does that work? Well, if you just looked at the exponent of i, it's our infinite power tower. i to the i to the i forever is what we called z. So our equation simplifies rather quickly as z equals i to the z. And this is just begging to apply the logarithm to both sides so that we can apply that property of logarithm that lets us drop that power down front. So we have ln z equals z ln i. Since we're solving for z, I'm going to move all the z's to the left-hand side. And it's time to apply our first tool. How do we compute the natural logarithm of i? The way it works, it's just the absolute value or the modulus of i. That's 1. That goes inside the natural logarithm. Plus i times the argument of i. That's the angle i makes with the x-axis, in this case, pi over 2. Natural log of 1 is still 0, so this is just i times pi over 2. Again, here, we're using the principal argument. Our next job is to try to solve for z using the Lambert function. And to do that, we need to write it in terms 
of z e to the z. And we can do that by being a little bit sneaky with our algebra. And the common technique is to insert an e to the power of a natural logarithm. To use the Lambert function like we want, we need an e, so let's put it there, but we can't put it there without compensating with the natural log. And writing it like this is looking awfully close to the form z e to the z. It's just that we have natural log z, but it works all the same. We do need to use the property of logarithm one time here again, just drop down that negative one, and the only thing missing is a negative out front. If we had minus ln z, then we'd be good to go. Let's just multiply both sides by a negative. And all of this was just leading to the fact now we can apply our Lambert w function to both sides since w of z e to the z is just z, or in this case, z is minus ln z. And although this is kind of a wonky looking thing, we can solve this using regular algebra rules. Just multiply both sides by a negative and exponentiate. We have z equals e to the minus w of minus i pi over 2. And that is an exact solution, although maybe not terribly satisfying. On the surface, I have no idea what this is supposed to be, not to mention how do you even calculate w. And that's where Newton's method comes in. By the way, you could go ahead and just plug this into a good enough calculator, but I always find that not very satisfying, and I have no idea where the answer came from, so sometimes I'm wary of it. But if I do it myself with something like Newton's method and get the same answer, I can feel pretty sure about it. I mentioned before that Newton's method is an algorithm, an iterative process that will approximate roots. Roots of equations, and the equation that we're trying to figure out here is w e to the w equals z. The z in particular is the minus i pi over 2. I'm trying to figure out what would we plug in to w e to the w to output minus i pi over 2. And since Newton's method approximates roots or zeros, let's set this equal to 0. This is the function we plug into Newton's method. We need its derivative. You just need to do the product rule with the w e to the w part. The derivative of a constant is 0. And this is what we're going to keep plugging into Newton's method. You do need to pick a starting point and initial value. I just chose minus i pi over 2, and that seemed to work. There's probably a better selection, but that's what I went with. And this is the point where you basically break out the calculator and just have to keep plugging this in over and over until you get close to what you want. And for me in this case, about five or six iterations, and this made me happy. And we're finally in a place where we can answer this question because the value we got for w of minus i pi over 2, we can just substitute back into that exponential and have our answer. Which does in fact match up with that graph from the beginning of the video. But you might see something a little bit troubling about this picture. Notice the second iteration. That was i to the i. It touches the real axis. Is i to the i a real number? You can find out in this video. The result might surprise you. I'll see you in that one.